Good morning, everyone. My name is John Sorensen. I'm with the Texas Juvenile Crime Prevention Center at the College of Juvenile Justice and Psychology at Prairie View A&M University. Today I want to talk to you about the Community Youth Development Program Evaluation. Uh, first, an overview of the presentation. I'm going to talk about the purpose and objectives. We'll talk about the risk and protective factors for delinquency, and then our own evaluation of the program, the results, conclusions, limitations, and some recommendations. The purpose, the CYD program was last evaluated by the Texas Criminal Justice Policy Council in 2002. While positive results were noted in the previous evaluation, it was not possible to attribute those directly to program participation. The present evaluation was completed to determine the effectiveness of CYD programs from state fiscal years 2007 through 2010, and now we've actually extended that through 2011. Uh, risk factors. Uh, no one factor, as you all well know, is responsible for youth engaging in delinquent and antisocial behavior. There are multiple factors that contribute to an increased likelihood of children and adolescents engaging in delinquent behavior. Such risk factors exist in several areas that influence youth development, including the individual, family, and school. I'm going to take a look at some of those specifically. Individual factors. You have impulsivity, risk-taking behavior, reactive aggression, and difficulty concentrating. For family risk factors, you have such things as poor parental bonding, insecure attachment, parental, parental neglect, low SES, and family stress. As far as school risk factors, you have poor academic achievement, low attachment to school, and of course, peer delinquency. And in the community, you have the availability of drugs and firearms, deterioration and disorganization, and limited access to quality educational and recreational opportunities. On the opposite side of the coin, you have protective factors. While there are many factors that contribute to the increased risk of delinquency, there are multiple protective or resiliency factors that contribute to a reduced risk of antisocial behavior among youth. Research has shown that exposure to more protective factors uh, decreases the risk of delinquency. Some of these are uh, corresponding to the risk factors. Individual, uh, such as the individual is socially competent, a good problem solver has a strong sense of autonomy and a sense of purpose about the future. Family protective factors include a caring and supportive family environment, high parental expectations, and the person needs to be acknowledged as a valuable member of the family. School protective factors, children need a caring and supportive school environment, high expectations from teachers and administrators, and meaningful participation and community protective factors, available social networks that promote and sustain social cohesion, a view of youth as resources and not problems, and an opportunity to be contributing members of society. As you all know, there are many types of juvenile delinquency prevention programs. Some examples are listed here, such as classroom and behavior management, multiple component classroom-based programs, social competence, conflict resolution, bullying prevention, recreation programs, mentoring programs, among others. Uh, there are certain principles that underlie effective prevention programs, and these are listed here for you. Comprehensive programming. There should be multiple interventions and settings. Varied teaching methods. It sh there should be interactive instruction with the ability uh, for the children to have hands-on instruction and experience. Also sufficient dosage. You need enough exposure to the treatment to ha or intervention to have an effect. And there should be an exposure to strong and positive relationships, delivery in a developmentally appropriate levels, socially, culturally relevant curriculum, inclusion of an outcome evaluation, and the involvement of well-trained staff. The Community Youth Development Program. I'm going to go briefly over the history, as uh, many of you already know this. In 1995, the, the 74th Texas Legislature allocated $10.5 million to the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services for the Community Youth Development Program. CYD programs were awarded to communities with high rates of juvenile crime, and programs were implemented uh, aimed at reducing the rate of juvenile crime. The selected CYD sites you see listed here, there's uh, Bear County, which is San Antonio, Cameron, which is Brownsville, two in Dallas. We had El Paso, Galveston, two in Harris County, um, Hidalgo, Lubbock, McLennan, Oasis, Potter, Tarrant, and Travis counties. 
Uh, the first thing I want to do is give you an overview of the race and ethnicity of CYD participants. As you can see, the majority are Hispanic, uh, almost 72 percent, followed by African Americans, Anglos, and then other groupings. Total is almost 50,000, uh, but you must remember 50,000 may have taken the pretest during FY 2007 to 2010, but only about 20,000 took the post test. Um, and we are looking from pretest to post test, so we'll be using that smaller number of individuals to gauge the effectiveness of programming. Evaluation measures that we used we looked at pre and post test data collected from the Protective Factors Survey instruments administered to program participants from FY 2007 to 2011. Now, remember, in the first year, there was a longer instrument from 2008 through 2010, there was a shorter instrument. And then more recently in FY 2011, we have our own two versions that we created, the Youth and the Child Survey. And um, we're looking at data from all those. We also look at TJPC referral data. And we're going to look at educational indi indicators. And you're going to receive a letter and be asked to help us do that. Uh, actually, specifically, you'll be asked to help us um, obtain consents from the parents and assents from the children and youth so that we can look at their educational records. The Protective Factors Survey was designed to measure protective factors, those promoting resiliency. As I already mentioned, there was an initial version, which was 49 items. There was a second version that was 27 items. Uh, both instruments included the same seven-point response options. And what we did is we just took the 27 items that were included in both surveys so that we could have consistency across that period. Higher scores on the instruments obviously equate to increased levels of protective factors in the youth. Lower scores indicate a higher level of risk. Uh, in order to use the instrument, we thought that we would do um, just a quick predictive uh, validation of the uh, survey items as that hadn't been done previously. So what we did is we looked at kids that had been referred to juvenile probation in 2010 and then those that were not among the CYD participants that filled out uh, a pretest. And what we see is if you look in the first column, no referral. And you look down, you'll see the mean. And then <clears throat> in the second part of that column, you'll see the standard deviation. If you look into the second set of columns, I guess you might say, you'll see the referral, those that were referred. Again, you have a mean and the standard deviation. And in the final column, you have the t-test, which shows that all are statistically significant. So let me give you an example. Overall, if you look in the first row of numbers, you see overall, that's the total scale score. The mean for those that were not referred was 4.91. The mean for those that were referred in 2010 was 4.52 significantly lower, right? Uh, as you would expect, uh, the kids that score lower on the PFS uh, are more likely to end up being referred to juvenile probation. And that's true on each of the subscales also if you look family, school, individual, and community. So what that told us was the scale seems to be working as, as it was intended and that it, sh it predicts uh, which of the kids are more likely to get into trouble. Okay, first, um, what I would like to give you uh, for the overall findings are the statewide paired sample t-test analyses for both the overall score on the PFS and also the domain scores. Uh, again, a little bit different this time, but what you see across the top is the pretest and the post-test. So the first two columns of numbers will be the pretest numbers, the mean, again, and the standard deviation, and then the second uh, set of columns will be the post test again the mean and the standard deviation and over to the far side you see the t-test which is showing again that the overall scale and all the subscales were significantly different from the pretest to the post test uh, let me give you an example we'll just go with the overall scale score it increased for all the kids that took the PFS during 2007 to 2010 statewide uh, it increased from 4.93 to 4.96 and you'll see other similar increases as you look down that scale. Uh, these are not huge increases, but they are statistically significant. 
Uh, here's another way of looking at those scale scores. Uh, we can actually look at the mean change in scale scores from pretest to post test. Um, and I give you the three groups here, the three major groups by race, ethnicity. The other numbers were too small to put in there. But what you see is that there actually is a bit of a difference. Hispanics and white slash Anglos uh, were more likely uh, to have, well, they experienced a greater uh, increase in protective factors. Uh, whereas African Americans, it was a little bit lower. Um, the other scores for the other groups um, were similar to those of African Americans and they didn't move quite as much. We also looked at differences by gender and you'll see that overall males had a little bit more movement. They're the, the purple lines there. They had a little bit more movement than the females. Um, but still both sets uh, for each gender were statistically significant across the overall scale and the subscales. We also looked at location and I got a few slides to show you here, but I'm going to flick through them fairly quick because I have all 15 counties. So, uh, and these can be found in our report um, and in the appendices, you'll see the newer data, the FY 2011 data um, that we collected for the PFSY and the PFSC. Um, and as you can see here, um, it, the easiest way to look at this is just to look at to the FAR column to the t-test and see uh, if you see some asterisks. If you do, you'll know it's statistically significant. So for instance, in Bear County, they had an increase on the community subscale um, and not much movement on the other subscales. I'm going to flick through these fairly quick. Cameron County, um, a bit of movement in three the overall scale, individual and community. Uh, Dallas, uh, you'll see a, a slight change in school, not so much in the others. Uh, the other Dallas, um, zip code, you'll see a change overall, and in all the subscales except for family. Uh, El Paso, you see a change in community subscale only. Uh, Galveston, a change in the individual subscale. Harris County, which is Houston, uh, you see a change in the overall scale, and for the family and community subscales in Pasadena. Uh, you see a change in the overall scale, school and community. For Hidalgo County, there was actually a change overall and for all of the subscales, and those were statistically significant. For Lubbock County, a change in the overall scale, the individual and community scales. McLennan uh, didn't have any, any statistically significant changes from the pretest to the post-test. Nueces either. Uh, Potter County. They had a uh, significant change in the overall uh, scale scores, family and community. Uh, Tarrant County, uh, overall family and school. And Travis County, only one of the subscales was statistically significant, and it was in the opposite direction expected. It was actually negative, which means that there was a decrease in protective factors from the pretest to the post-test. Another thing that we looked at to determine sort of the effectiveness of the programming was the referral rate to TJPC for FY 2010 for all the various areas that the program was implemented. And these are actually the CYD participants and um, if you look you'll see there's county, city in the second column, zip code, the number of CYD participants in the fourth column, and then we have the number of referrals in the fifth and we actually have calculated a rate of referral per 1,000, and that's per youth age 10 to 16. And what you see is, um, for instance, Bear County has a rate of five per 1,000 referrals among their 2,569 participants. That's quite low. In Cameron County, there none of those kids ended up going to TYC, or I'm sorry, TJPC. And if you look at the rest of the figures, you'll notice that they're all comparatively low when we look at uh, general rates of referral for those neighborhoods, which suggested to us that mm, the results from the PFS, pretest to post-test, uh, they confirmed our suspicions that CYD programming was probably successful in increasing protective factors and resilience among participants. 
Uh, the results indicate that for many of the participants in several of the identified areas, there were positive changes in overall scores and in specific domains when comparing pretest and post-test measures. There are some limitations associated with this study. The first is that the changes in the PFS from the pretest to the post-test could have resulted from factors other than CYD program participation. We can never be sure. It's possible that the kids were involved in other programs and we didn't sort that out. The failure of most providers to obtain even to even obtain post-test for a majority of the participants is also problematic. I mean, if you think about it, we had 50,000 kids that filled out a pretest, then we have 20,000 upon exit that filled out a post-test at any point in time. That's uh, pretty low. That's about 40 percent. If those children that, and youth that filled out a post-test are different, let's say, than those that didn't complete the program, we could have some bias involved. Uh, there's also a lack of standardization across program curricula between zip codes, and that's a limitation to an overall evaluation like this because we can't really say, well, one program is doing better or worse than another because we don't know the specifics of what each program is doing and what factors in that program contributes to success. A related limitation was the inability to accurately measure treatment dosage by program. Um, and that's very important too. As you know, we have these treatment units, as they call them, but those units are, are very different from one program to another, and they're not standardized. Uh, it's very important that we look at the actual types of treatment programs and the dosage, and then how the children, individual children, respond to that. Some recommendations for best practices. Uh, first, we would suggest that that you model and implement prevention programs after those that have already been found to be effective. Why reinvent the wheel? If there's a program that already exists and it's been studied many times and we know that curricula is successful, then it should be used. We also suggest that separate evaluations of each service provided within the programs are looked at. We need to know which aspects of which programs are succeeding and which uh, aspects of certain programs may not be as successful or may not be necessary. We'd also suggest continued systematic program evaluation with data collected at the individual level via pilot studies to address the efficiency and effectiveness of program implementation. Basically what we need to know is for individual children what works best for them and the only way to really do that is to get at program level data within each of the locations. All right, I'd like to thank you for your participation today. Again, I'm John Sorensen from Prairie View A&M University. While the presentation was brief, we do have an assignment for you. Please go to the website and fill out the survey. Uh, we will have an opportunity for you to ask questions and we'll respond to them. Uh, you have one week to do so. Please fill it out by the 26th. Again, from all of us at Prairie View A&M University, thank you.